Hello, and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. Today, we're going to focus on the recent leftward shift within the Democratic Party, particularly on issues involving race, gender, and the economy, and how the Republican Party is reacting. There's long been a left wing of the Democratic Party, but it's now larger and more influential than it ever was while Presidents Clinton and Obama were in office. Most recently, reactions to Donald Trump's presidency and the success of Bernie Sanders' campaign have played a part in that growth, but the current progressive movement also has roots in the Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter movements. And the left's ideas aren't just shaping the policies of mainstream politicians, but of institutions and businesses as well. There has also been a growing backlash on the right against what's referred to as woke ideology and cancel culture. In a pair of articles published on the 538 website this week, my colleague Perry Bacon Jr. details the kinds of ideas that have gained currency on the left and how the right has responded, and how all of that could shape our national politics. Perry is here with me to discuss his reporting, so welcome, Perry. Thanks for having me, Galen. To start things off, what are the ideas that have gained prominence on the left in recent years? So as I what I was trying to lay out in the piece was you had this initial rise of Black Lives Matter, and that created the, a lot of discussion around 2013, 2014, 2015 around the specific issues of race, particularly African Americans and how the police treated them. But you've now seen sort of a, a growth of other ideas that sort of sprang from that, but are sort of that you read a lot on kind of left Twitter, you see in books, like I think the fact that like Isabel Wilkerson's cast and Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be Anti-Racist, are very popular for these reasons. So the the ideas that I try to look at in the piece were, um, I'll go through these 10 quickly. So one is this idea that America is in some ways kind of a flawed country. It's not exceptional. America's never been a true democracy because it's never really allowed women, Native Americans, Black Americans full participation in, the, in politics. Uh, two, this idea that white people have advantages, sort of white privilege. Three, the idea that we have sort of systemic institutional racism. Four, the idea that capital, capitalism is like really flawed in the way it works in America today. You know, you heard this idea that maybe there shouldn't be any billionaires, for example. That's like the fourth idea. The uh, fifth is that women suffer from a kind of systemic sexism. The sixth is that people should be able to identify with whatever gender they would like or not a gender at all. Uh, the seventh is that Basically, the existence of a disparity is evidence of discrimination, meaning if you go to a workplace and they only have one black employee of every 40 people, and that means that that workplace is discriminatory, even if we can't find any sort of evidence of real where they didn't hire a black person, what have you. The eighth idea is sort of reparations, cash reparations for black people because of slavery and uh, discrimination. Uh, The ninth idea is along the lines of sort of abolish ICE and defund the police. The idea that law enforcement agencies like ICE and the police are kind of inherently designed to treat people of color and black people negatively and 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 therefore they need to be reformed, disbanded, radically changed. And the tenth idea is essentially that Trump was not an aberration, that uh, a lot of white conservatives, a lot of conservatives, a lot of Republicans have always kind of had negative edges of people of color and sort of so Trumpism was sort of nothing new and it's kind of what the Republican Party has always been about to some extent. And how did you synthesize these down into those kind of 10 discrete ideas? So I'm not going to pretend this was a scientific process, but I was really trying to think about like, you know, like, like a lot of people I know have read this How to Be an Anti-Racist book from Ibram Kendi, you know, some of the works of Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates have become popular. So I was looking for things that I think are are in the dis that I, that I think people actually are really talking about seriously and are ideas that are impacting our policy. Like you saw Biden issued this um, executive order saying that we're going to look at all policies through it, through their effects on systemic racism and re- racial equ- equity. And so I think that's an idea that sort of came from this idea that we have systemic racism. So I was looking for ideas like I don't think most I don't think that like, you know, intersectionality has really entered the People are thinking about that. I don't think it's like in the policy discourse. I was looking for things where there's an idea here that either a left wing democratic style politician is now kind of put in their platform. And I mean, mainly more like an AOC or Ayanna Presley type than Biden. But I mean, what are ideas that are in the political discourse on the left or that the right is trying to really fight? For example, there are a lot of legislators that are trying to sort of ban the teaching of the New York Times 1619 Project 
the one that's really about sort of slavery. So you can see things that the right is trying to fight or ban really formally. Like a lot of states are trying to say cities in those states can't defund the police. And I think that gets or reduce funding for the police. And I think that gets to the fact that these are ideas that sort of have made it up and are now really affecting policy. That's what I was trying to get at, affecting real politicians and real policy. Where do these ideas come from? And in particular, why have they grown in popularity over the past five years or so? So, for example, like, it's not as if no one has ever talked about reparations before. This is like an idea that existed for literally, you know, more than 100 years. But is what you've seen is there's a, been a larger discussion of it in political circles in, and has become more relevant. For example, like when I looked it up in for this story, Gallup had not polled, Gallup polled reparations in 2019. That was the first time they had done that since 2002. So it's not like reparations didn't exist, but it was sort of, and I, and I sort of asked them and they were like, sort of like, this was not really part of the discourse for a while. So it wasn't really something we needed to poll. Uh, the, the, the polling firm PRRI asked the question along the lines of, do you think the Republican Party has been taken over by racists? And, and they, their pollster told me too, that was not a question we thought to ask, you know, in 2013 or 2015 or have you, they haven't existed that long. There was a question we haven't thought of asking before because it wasn't sort of in the discourse before. But you do have ideas, like there have been people talking about police funding being reduced or so on for a long time. But that one, I would argue, is more new to the sort of mainstream political discourse than before. And I think a lot of these ideas are coming from academia, academia, like you like intersectionality, that kind of concept um, is from academia. Some of them are coming from the Black Lives Matter movement. This broad critique of capitalism, I think, came from, in some ways, the Warren and Sanders campaign. So it's like, I don't think any of the ideas I just laid out were particularly, well, I mean, some of the thoughts about transgender are sort of more new because that's a, an issue, again, that's sort of newer to the political space. But none of these sort of came from nowhere. But I think a lot of these ideas are things that we weren't polling or Democratic politicians weren't really talking about because they weren't being really, so I, I think what I'm trying to say is they weren't really part of the discourse as opposed to being how do you, and things get in the discourse because activists talk about them, Twitter helps them get on the discourse, and then often politicians either talk about them or talk about versions of these ideas. For example, like as the reparations discussion has gotten hotter, there's been a, um, a commission, there's been this idea in the, among Democrats in the House to do a, to create a reparations commission that would study reparations. Like the actual demands of activists in the real world is not a study. They want reparations done, but the way that has gotten into politics is now there's a reparations commission idea that by Biden has sort of quasi-endorsed. We've talked about two different movements here a little bit, sort of the Occupy movement and the Bernie Sanders and Warren campaigns, which were part of a critique of capitalism and economic inequality. And then there's also the Black Lives Matter movement and more recently the George Floyd protests, which are more about racial justice. How are the two interacting within this movement? Is this kind of mostly a critique of how the country deals with race? To what extent does an economic message play into it? You've had this discussion for a while about like polarization and how the how the country is more polariz polarized than partisan. And I think at some point those those terms do describe something, but I think at some point they they became to me sort of almost code words where we weren't we weren't really we were sort of saying everything's polarized without saying really what we're polarized about or what we're partisan about or what those things. So when on inauguration day when Biden said we're in an uncivil war, I think that I think Uncivil war is more descriptive and tells you these are very tense fights that I think are not well. I think that framing of it, I think, was helpful to me. And I think that that is more accurate in, in terms of how deep and deep set these fights are and, how, and also sort of how the struggle is not just people are have just voted for different people. They're really fighting over fundamental issues. And in my view, what you're seeing on the left is to some extent, like the Democratic Party has always been kind of, I'll call it equality focused, but I think that, you know, the, the civil rights movement was sort of grounded in the Democratic Party. But I think to some extent, what you're seeing is the Democratic Party is now sort of organized around economic, racial, sexual identity, gender, like equality. We want to make things more equal is kind of the organizing idea in a lot of ways for the Democratic Party more than so it's like economics and it's race 
and its class and its culture, but it's all around this kind of equality idea. Again, Democrats are not new to this, but I think it's sort of more, it's kind of, you t- if you listen to an AOC Warren type, they're, they're like left on racial issues and on economic issues. And I think that's kind of where the party is going. And in the Republican Party, the Republican Party has always been kind of the party that more defends the current racial and economic status quo. But I think that's become like the center of the Republican Party is now this kind of status quo defense in part because the left is sort of pushing harder. And I think that's driving some of the status quo defense. And I think that's kind of and when you think about the uncivil war, part of that thing is like the Republicans feel like the left is moving aggressively and they are sort of responding in turn with some of their more aggressive kind of. July, January 6th, trying to stop people from voting in Georgia, that kind of thing. So I think that's where I, so in other words, the Democratic Party is really, has sort of, is, is equality focused. And I think that links the economics with the racial stuff. Yeah, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about how the Republican Party is reacting to all of this. But I want to dig in a little bit more to how it is affecting the ecosystem of Democrats and the left more broadly. So when we talk about the views of Elizabeth Warren or AOC, uh, you know, we're talking about one wing of the party. How widespread are these views amongst Democrats? So we looked at some polling and it depends, it, and it really has a wide range on the issues. Like, for example, um, it looks like cash reparations, at least in some polling I've seen, is getting to a point where it's like 40 Sometimes our polling from Gallup showed 49, depends on how you ask it, but between a third and half of Democrats support cash reparations, and that was much bigger than it was in two, you know, in a, a few years ago, that was like in the teens generally. So that's one issue where it's like split. When you look at like police funding should be reduced, I think Pew asked this question last year, it was around 40% of Democrats think police funding should be reduced. So that's getting close to half. Um, there was a, you know, AOC, I think if you said a couple years ago, or some Democrats are saying every billionaire is a policy failure because the idea being you should never be able, get able to accumulate a, a billion dollars. That's the idea that's like in the 30s among Democrats. The idea the Republican Party has been taken over by racists is like shared by 78%, you know, close to 70% of Democrats. Um, the idea it's a, lot, it's a lot more difficult to be black compared to being white in America, 70%. So you have some of these things, the sort of racial ideas particularly, are to the point where they are a majority of Democrats generally, reparations being different. So some of these things are quite popular. The idea that it's hard, you know, the idea, the sort of general idea is that the country does not treat black people well is a very popular idea. Reparations among among Democrats, sorry. Reparations themselves, about half and half, less popular. The sort of wealth inequality ideas depends on how you ask them. Police funding, generally unpopular among Democrats. Reducing police funding, unpopular among Democrats. So there is a range, but I think in general we're talking about views that the sort of AOC wing does hold. Then the Biden wing, it depends on how you think about it. And so the case I was making was essentially that these are views that are not becoming the you know the democratic party's point of view but they're affecting the democratic party and the democratic party is trying to sort of meet these views kind of a quarter or halfway how much has opinion on these things changed over the past five years or so and amongst whom like what who are the actual people within the democratic party that hold these views so if you look at a question like reparations, for example, where Gallup had a poll, like I said, Gallup hadn't polled this in a while, but it went from 25 in 2002 to 49 in 2019. And what you generally saw in those polls was that black Democrats generally for, were for reparations even in 2002. There's a growing number of white Democrats who have reparations. Other polling I've seen suggests younger Democrats and more liberal Democrats and are particularly more supportive of reparations than they used to be. That's not shocking. Um, when you get to this question of it's a lot more difficult to be a black person than a white person in America, Pew did this question in, in 2016. The number then was 57%. The number then is now is 74%. I would assume, I have not, I didn't look up the cross tabs on that. Generally questions like that show that black people had those views already and that particularly college-educated white Democrats are moving toward those views as well. Uh, Let's see. There are more than two gender identities. 
We only had this question from from recently, but that's generally that's 52 percent of Democrats and 40 percent of Americans. But I think only 20 percent of Republicans think there can be more than two gender identities. That's, again, one where I, where the more liberal Democrats are more likely to think that. So uh, so the sort of some so police funding um, is, a, is at 41 percent younger and black Democrats are more likely to support um reducing police funding than older Democrats and white Democrats. You mentioned that these ideas are not necessarily the dominant ones within the party. They're not necessarily Biden administration policy, but nonetheless, they are shaping mainstream policy within the party. What are some examples of that, maybe in terms of what Biden has already done as president or how he campaigned? So, uh, so I mentioned earlier that they that they announced this executive order on racial equity and fighting systemic racism, which I don't think that which I think is something that like, the administration is very focused on. For example, making sure the vaccine um, access is as equitable as they can. They're very focused on that because they're very focused on this idea that there should be racial equity. I'm not saying Obama didn't do that, but I'm saying on day one, Biden had an executive order saying one of our big focuses is on racial equality and so on. That's sort of an obvious example. The second is like I would say if you look at like Biden is never going to say I'm going to abolish ICE, but they're certainly trying to make ICE ICE different than under Trump, like make it less harsh. And I think part of that, the abolish ICE movement did not succeed in getting Biden to be for that, but he's definitely open to changes, reforming. Again, it's hard to sort of pin down, did Biden arrive at this view independently of them but i think it's clear that that the ice abolish ice movement created a discussion in the party that sort of affected some conduct there let's see so those are the two that are sort of obvious to me i mentioned if you look at a lot of cities around the country you see that nobody is saying we're going to defund the police but there's a lot of talk about reallocating funds moving funds to social services um like the washington post this week had a big feature about how we need to reimagine public safety. That was not something the Washington Post was editorializing about uh, two years ago. I think that came from a, you know, we're not sure, like the, the Post even acknowledged, we're not sure that defunding is right, but we need to reimagine this in a lot of ways. Another one being that like the stimulus bill, um, unlike economic policy in the Clinton and Obama years, the stimulus bill gave money to people directly. It was something Andrew Yang campaigned on. Um, the stimulus bill was kind of disregarded the idea of the deficit and really focused on like giving people a lot of money. It sort of was a bill that fit in. It was a, you know, I, I, if you'd asked me who's going to sign a $1.9 trillion bill that gives people money directly, I would of the candidates who ran in president in 2020, I would have not named Joe Biden in that list early. But I think it's pretty clear that those ideas kind of have gotten these sort of like he's hired a lot of Warren staff. I think those ideas have gotten in the mainstream of the party. Right. And of course, I I didn't mention this earlier, but the pandemic has also played a large role in kind of reshaping the Democratic Party in terms of policy. You do see right now that there is a sort of tension over the Biden administration's policies at the border, where the left flank of the party is kind of already frustrated with how some migrants, particularly children, are being treated. Uh, You know, the Biden administration is basically asking for time to reorganize uh, the immigration enforcement system and so on. How do you see the relationship between Biden and the left flank of the party playing out over the next four years? Is this a tense relationship? I mean, so far, the left seems happy with the American Rescue Plan. But, you know, when the two parts of the party disagree, who wins? I mean, Biden's in charge. And, and also, as I noted in these in the article, a lot of these views are not like a lot of the views I'm talking about, like we shouldn't have billionaires. These are minority views in the Democratic Party. So they're really minority views in the country. So ultimately, Biden not only is president, but he and he and Pelosi can say in many cases, is not only that the left's view is not our view and we're in charge, but also the left's view is not where the majority of Americans are. And for electability purposes, we need to be where the majority of Americans are. So the left is going to lose most of these arguments it, when the full-fledged left idea, like a wealth tax, a wealth tax actually is sort of popular, but the idea that we shouldn't have billionaires or the idea that we should have reparations, you never get the left is not going to win these debates in full. They're not going to get their policy, my guess is really ever. 
but can we get a reparations commission? That's a different question. And I think that gets to the point where Biden may be persuaded to say yes, or maybe I think Gavin Newsom or something like that might do where it's maybe even less, maybe it's even more popular. So I think you're going to see some of these things happen in states as well. So I think right now, you know, Biden's chief of staff, Ron Klain, is on Twitter a lot. He's the new he's the new Donald Trump in terms of tweeting in this administration. He's on Twitter. He tweets a lot. He also seems to be courting the left in other ways. Like as we speak today, um, Wednesday, Klain met with Jaya Paul, who's the lead Congressman Jaya Paul, who's the leader of the Progressive Caucus on the Hill. And Ron Klain is in a lot of outreach. He's I read somewhere this week that he talks to Sanders regularly on the phone. So I think the idea is for the Biden team right now is let's bring the left in the tent. Let's hear them out. Let's let them criticize us in private, hopefully. We know that AOC is going to criticize us in public some too. But the idea, I think, is to kind of unify the party and sort of like keep those tensions as low as possible. Ultimately, there's the, when the brass tax hits, there are going to be issues. I think immigration is one where the left position is just not going to be something Biden can abide by. But I think they're going to try to sort of soften those differences as much as possible. You mentioned that a lot of these ideas are not electorally viable and Democrats probably won't try to win national elections running on them. Are there some ideas here that are? And in particular, I do want to key in on the American Rescue Plan here because it is broadly popular. And it gives, as you mentioned, cash directly to either in tax credits that are actually paid by the federal government or in direct payments themselves to a lot of people. And when you look at the breakdown, a lot of this money is going to poor whites who are in large part in a different party, in the Republican Party. Is this seen as an actual way to bring Republicans, poor whites in particular, into the Democratic fold? Do they think that's possible electorally? Or is this just like, we broadly, is this an ideological belief, which is that like poverty is bad and we want to reduce it, but we don't actually think these people are ever going to join our party? Oh, no, no. The left people very much think, and this was like a core of Sanders' campaign in particular, the the idea is the the economic populism, give people money, so on, is good policy and also good politics. And the rescue plan has, as we've you talked about a lot on this podcast, polls in the 70s, sometimes in the 80s, that giving people money directly is extremely popular. So I, Trump was doing it too. So I think the economic parts of this, the sort of like, I don't think you're going to get a lot of voters who are going to say capitalism is bad. I think that's not going to poll well. Or I don't think voters, I think Americans tend to think billionaires are good, smart people. There's some, Bill Gates seems like a good, smart, you know, smart person to me. There's some evidence for that. But so, but I think if you get beyond the sort of, we should change our economic system to what the policies underlying that are, we should tax the wealthy more. We should give more people money directly. We should create more public jobs. We should create more infrastructure. The economic policy ideas of the left are actually fairly popular and they're actually popular with with Biden too. Biden is not necessarily an ideological centrist. He's sort of a shape shape to shift in a certain way. The other thing that is popular is I think that is the um the trans, the you know, treating trans people equally is very popular. It's like, you know, Americans don't tend to like the idea that people should get discriminated against. Like most people don't necessarily know a trans person in, in America or they, they mean, you know, but they still are wary of, of treating people badly. The idea that women and minorities you know, the, the police in other parts of America, the, the policing part of treating black people better is actually fairly popular too. Um, don't separate children from their families is very popular. So it's even on these sort of racial issues, the Democrats are popular. It's more that the, the, the most left position usually isn't that popular. But I think if, like, if you look at, Biden is actually extremely savvy about, you know, what's popular is my impression. And like, like, I don't think we should fo- we should focus on systemic racism is a view that I think is probably a majority view in the country. I, I think that I think I saw a poll of, in fact, of the executive order. We should focus on systemic racism and address that is a majority view. We should give reparations is not. And I, I know those two are related, but you can probably get to a position where you're saying one and not the other. So, again, the left is not necessarily. Also, the left is aware that the people on the left list are aware that they lost the primary and Biden won it. So I think they're aware that. That they, there is some rethinking on the left about, and the left is a broad group of people that includes a lot of different constituencies, but there is some rethinking in the left about is talking about white privilege smart or not using that kind of phrasing. Like, you know, there's a book out by um, 
Heather McGee. It's called The Sum of All, Some of Us. And there's a lot of discussion on the left about that book. And her argument is basically the way for the left to sort of succeed in its economic populism is to talk about ideas that affect everybody. Even even some, like if, like in, in fact, the idea I think she talks about is like when you pass a law that makes it harder to vote, that might make it harder for black people to vote, but it may also almost inevitably will make it harder for white people to vote too. And so the way to sort of make, so you can see the left is sort of trying to make their arguments more, this issue affects black people or Hispanics disproportionately, but it also affects white people. Obviously, giving checks to people who, giving people who, giving people $400 is going to help black and Latino people more because they tend to have less income, but it will also help white people too. And you're seeing that sort of synergy, which is why I think that the left versus center fights are going to be less tense because Biden is trying to have a unified party and the left is trying to be a little more electorally savvy. You talked about a lot of ideas that are gaining traction within the left, within the Democratic Party, and how they're reverberating and reacting to the larger party ecosystem. But of course, there's another party here. And so writ large, how is the right reacting to these ascendant ideas that you described? So these are ideas that are really opposed on the right. Like, you know, like the right is divided on like the minimum wage where a lot of Republican voters support raising the minimum wage, but the politicians on the Republican Party generally don't. But when we talk about ideas like we're talking about here, reparations, that, that America is not exceptional and a great nation that should be a model for others. We're talking about um, this idea that it's really hard to be black in America. You, when we talk about defunding the police or reducing funding for the police, these ideas are incredibly unpopular in the Republican Party. And so there and, there, and therefore, there's a some extent of the Republican Party to elevate these ideas too and to say Joe Biden believes in these things because these things are often very unpopular. You know, interestingly, in terms of having a negative view of capitalism, that's 44% of Democrats, that's 33% of Americans, that's 20% of Republicans. Um, only uh, so every billionaire is a policy failure, that's 20% of Republicans. It's a lot more difficult to be a black person in America. 9% of Republicans. Police funding should be re reduced. 8% of Republicans. Cash reparation for black Americans. 5% of Republicans. White people benefit a great deal from advantages black people don't have. 5% of Republicans. So, and also a lot of these views are not supported by a majority of people. Cash reparations is not very popular. Police funding is not very popular. So a lot of the ideas that are emerging on the left are unify the Republican Party and, and, put, and put the Republican Party with the majority of the electorate. Right. Divide the Democratic Party, which yeah. is, you know, an important electoral tactic, as you describe yeah. in the piece. This dynamic, kind of broadly speaking, is one that we've seen played out in some cases over decades, right? The Democratic Party has played the role of pushing the country on social and cultural issues, and the Republican Party has played the role of pushing back. And sometimes the, you know, the left wins and their social movement becomes broadly accepted by society, and sometimes it doesn't. What's new or different about this moment when we think of it in that broader historical context? So if you look at like an issue like gay marriage, where in 2004, people pushed for same-sex marriage, it's sort of the, the Republicans campaign against that, some, anti, some amendments to make marriage between a man and a woman pass. It looks like in 2004, that's a bad issue for the Democrats. They've pushed social, a social issue. Even It's more like Democratic activists pushed it, and that became an issue. John Kerry was sort of not sure what to say. Bush was strongly opposed to it. He does, it doesn't seem to have helped. I don't, I'm not going to be able to prove that killed John Kerry. I think he might have lost anyway, but that was not a helpful issue. Fast forward to today. You know, same-sex marriage is, univer is sort of not universally at all, but it's like a majority position, fairly popular, hard to oppose, at least in public. So that's kind of where I think so. Some issues go that way. On the other hand, like, you know, busing for school integration was an idea that was sort of more popular on the left. It never became the majority position. So you never know. So what I think is different about these issues is not really – the, the issue it's not really that different in that we have the Democratic Party is sort of pushing these sort of more equality minded change positions representing kind of disadvantaged groups and the Republicans are opposing that in some ways like I think this is like nothing new and on some level like 
Trump was saying law and order when the, when there was police reform attempts this year that happened in the 60s and 70s with Nixon as well. Um, what's really different is like the issues we're talking about have changed. Like we weren't talking about transgender Americans in 2004. So that's a different group we're talking about. We weren't really talking about reparations in 2004. It's a different issue we're talking about. The idea that billionaires are bad was just not sort of in the landscape in 2004, even really in 2016. Um, and so I think, and so the, so the couple things are different. One is that the issues themselves, obviously were in 2021, so the issues are different than they were in 2004. Two is that the Republican Party and the country are different. And when I say that, really the country is much more racially diverse, also more diverse amongst on sexual identity, on, on, uh, on, on gender issues. Like the, the country is not more diverse, but is more cognizant of the problems women might face, for example. Um, there are more people identify who as transgender or gay. There are more people who are, who are Latino and um, Asian in particular. So the country is different. And so what I was getting into in the piece a little bit is that the Republican Party is has some incentive to not be kind of openly against some of these equality causes, which leads to invocations of phrases like woke and cancel culture, which capture some real phenomenons, but also are a way to say it much is much easier to say, I don't want people to be canceled than I don't want to use the right pronoun, even though we're often, so those issues are often sort of circulating in the same conversations. Yeah. You know, as far as the right is concerned, what do the terms woke and cancel culture mean? Um, and I know you said right there that they're maybe intentionally a little bit vague, but what, it, you know, if you had to define them as far as the sure. right is concerned, how would you? So woke on the right is kind of the ideas I'm talking about, these sort of left wing ideas that are really trying to push us too far on these kind of equality dimensions. Like we have to call everyone, you know, the idea that we have to really accept transgender people on whatever sports team they want to be on and in every way possible. The idea, you know, gender is more than there are two more than two genders. The idea that obviously it's clear that black people suffer from suffer from discrimination and that white people have privilege. The idea that these things are not contestable. Like reparations is like an idea that they that is sort of in the sort of woke. So a lot of ideas around race and economic equality that the people on the right feel like are going way too far. And then when you talk about cancel culture, what we're usually talking about is on the right. And I mean, let me answer this question two ways. Like on the right, what we're usually talking about is if I criticize this idea of the left, then the, then the criticism I get back is excessive and too hard. And occasionally I sort of feel socially canceled as in like I get all this criticism rained down on me. I'm called a bigot or a racist or a sexist. And occasionally I'm actually canceled as in my Twitter account is removed like Donald Trump or, I, or my book deal is canceled as what happened to Senator Hawley. So there's actually or my invitation to speak on a campus is um is is revoked and i should note here that some of these things there are some people in the like obama has talked about the sort of his concern that about the canceling speakers on college campuses so some of this is like there is a real debate about like which we have changing social mores in the country and what should be done if you don't sort of conform to those and what should be the punishment if you don't conform to those. And I think that's a broad debate happening on The Bachelor or ha and happening in a variety of ways. But on the right, often what's going on is like Josh Hawley is not just talking about views. He's also talking about people canceled me my book deal after I supported the insurrection. And I think that's a different thing where people, where that's like, he's sort of taking that term to mean anything. We all, we have always had punishments. If people think you go over the line, like Twitter removed Trump because they perceived him as inciting an insurrection. That's a different issue than, than that's sort of like the sort of use of any, anybody, anytime anybody criticizes me is cancel culture. That's when we get into sort of what's happening on the right a little bit is like a broad based criticism that is vague and sort of used to sort of absolve all kinds of behavior. And so it sounds like it means cancel culture means different things to different people. Different and people. In some I ways, I should have said that. Yeah. In some ways it's a tool, right. To basically say, you know, if you criticize, even if the things that I do are unpopular with the broader public, if you criticize me, you're canceling me. Whereas yes. it also has a meaning 
for the broader public, which is like, you know, someone does something or says something insensitive in the public square and faces a backlash. They might not even be a known quantity. They lose their job, whatever. They are disinvited to speak. How, you know, I guess it's complicated because it means different things to different people, but how does the public more broadly view the idea of cancel culture and, and wokeness? So the polling I've seen has shown one, like a large number of people don't know what cancel culture is. And, you know, and so like 30, 40 percent. But when you sort of explain it to them, generally people are opposed to cancel culture. That's not surprising. Cancel. It's in some ways political correctness is also doesn't poll well because it seems, you know, it seems like we're imposing norms on people that seem silly. So when you use that phrase cancel culture that's sort of unpopular when people think about it both on the right and on the left is fairly unpopular when you get to examples of should this person be fired it sort of becomes very like if someone uses the n-word in public most people that and they get fired that would be a sort of a cancellation i would assume but i think most people would support that it depends on so, it depends, so it, you, often it becomes very context dependent whether people support the underlying action or not but yeah, but people do not think the idea, but it's smart if you're running, but the, invoking this idea that these woke people are canceling everyone is actually a pretty smart tactic because cancel culture is, is as a phrase is not popular. Yeah. I mean, what are the politics of this? Is this becoming sort of a policy agenda? Like, are there policies that can be enacted around opposing wokeness and cancel culture? And how are, this seems somewhat elite driven. Like it doesn't seem like there's a necessarily a grassroots movement against cancel culture. Um, I hear a lot about it a lot on Fox News or from politicians, um, but you don't see like a Tea Party style movement, you know, activating against it. So I guess one, what are the policies that stem from this? And two, how is this used in politics? The policy related to this are, for example, you're seeing that um, I think Ron DeSantis and maybe in Texas Abbott as well. There's a, there's a lot of initiatives along the lines of we want to fine, punish, or what have you, social media companies who throw people off their platforms. Like that's a clearly like if you clearly saying that Twitter or Facebook should not take conservatives off, and you're seeing a lot of proposals like that. You're seeing proposals in states to ban the teaching of crit critical race theory and the 1619 project. You're seeing policies to stop to stop the defunding of the police. So, so this, this is a wide range of things I'm talking about here. So, and it, so that, and it goes to the point again, but I think the sort of main focus of this like sort of cancel culture idea is to sort of justify the sort of taking on the left in this sort of racial and internet way in terms of conversation. Like particularly, I think that idea, the social media companies should not be able to remove people from their platforms for really any reason. That's sort of a real outgrowth of you should not be able to cancel us. And therefore here's a policy that comes from that notion. So that's kind of, kind of how it plays. So you're seeing Republican governors, state legislators really focus on that aspect of it. So that's kind of how it plays in terms of policy. In terms of politics, you saw that like CPAC, the first, big event for the Republican Party post-Trump was the, the, the sort of headline for that conference was America Uncanceled. And what I think it plays out in the Republican Party is cancel culture has become this broad thing that means from we're defending the police to we're defending Trump from being banned by Twitter, to we're, we're defending against the Democrats trying to talk about race too much, we're defending against Democrats trying to make transgenderism kind of universal. So it sort of fits as a politics because it's sort of like all encompassing on some level. So I think you see it's sort of, it's, the, it's a phrase you can use to almost attack any leftward idea and sort of defend like a lot of conservative ideas. So you're seeing it play out as that. So I agree it's like an elite idea itself but i think the republicans are sort of saying we are defending you against cancel culture as a way to motive i think the base does know what they're talking about sarah yeah. huckabee launched her sarah huckabee sanders trump's old press secretary launched her campaign to be arkansas governor by saying i fought the people who tried to cancel me and i'm going to do that i think that cancel culture is becoming a means of saying i'm going to fight against the sort of overly powerful left and i think that and i think that's and i even though it's an elite phrase right now i think people are going to gradually get what they're talking about so I've asked this question a couple times on this podcast, but I'm curious for your perspective as well. You know, this is very clearly the culture war of the 2020s, essentially. 
Um, when we look at history or when we look at the specifics of today, do culture wars usually trump issues like taxes, infrastructure, healthcare, things like that? Like applying this to electoral politics, like like we did when we were talking about how it works within the Democratic Party, do voters care more about these kinds of things? Um, because of course it can, you know, these cultural wars can inspire very visceral feelings amongst people. Um, we've seen it throughout history. Does it trump the the kind of like bread and butter issues that the Biden administration really tries to tries seems to be trying to focus on? I think this question is probably yes. And so historically, the Republican Party's policy, economic policy views have been unpopular. Like, like this idea of cutting tax for the rich is never popular. But the idea is that we're defending the status quo. We're defending against minorities asking for too many rights too fast. That's historically, the Republican Party has sort of campaigned on these sort of backlash to these equality things for a long time. And that's often been successful. I would say in 2020, it's like, in, in, in the sole process, we've been talking about a lot like the Latino shift toward Trump. And this is a complicated story. But I think part of it is like, you know, Trump campaigned from the, all four years on sort of cultural conservatism. And that means defending the police, defending against sort of like, you know, sort of woke ideas in a variety of ways. And I think those sort of cult ideas of America, is, a lot of Americans are culturally conservative. And that's a sort of a vague term, but intentionally vague. But if you poll a lot of black and Latino voters about, do you support the police being funny, being cut? They don't support that either. So in some ways, like focusing, you know, sort of focusing on this sort of cultural lines of socialism. Do you believe in America? Is America a great place? Do you believe in um, billionaires? Do you think racism is a big issue or do you want to talk about racism a lot and focus on racial divides? Those things are not as popular as let's increase the minimum wage. So I think that is true that if you divide on, if you talk about these sort of culturalized issues a lot, that probably is more advantageous to the Republican Republicans than talking only about economic issues. But in reality, like in some ways, like because the country is divided on these issues, because Fox News is focused on these issues, there's no way for Biden to get around them. And because the left, for that matter, cares about some of these racialized issues, too, there's no way to get around the fact that, yeah, I probably I mean, there's no way to get around the fact that um, identity and culture have sort of been pol part of politics you know, from the beginning on some level, like slavery, you know, was an identity politics issue, you know, to say it's sort of silly in a silly way. But I think you, I don't know if you can get around these things, but, and it depends on sort of how they play out. Like it looks to me like the Democratic Party is trying to figure out how do we have a message that talks about racialized issues in an inclusive way. The idea being that like giving people $1,400 addresses economic concerns and also might help with systemic racism. That's kind of what Biden is trying to do. And the Republicans are trying to do basically Biden is obsessed with talking about race all the time to the exclusion of helping you on issue Y and X. That might work too. Um, the answer to this question is really complicated because it's not as if people have in their head an economic economic issues and racial issues. And those are sort of intertwined. Like um, Heather McGee's book makes this point that I hadn't thought of before, which is like Latinos in Texas became more wary of Medicaid reform when Medicaid reform was defined as something to help or Medicaid expansion when Medicaid expansion was defined as something to help poor black people. You know, it's like, you know, when sort of and when sort of when you get when issues are sort of racialized and sort of cast as this helps maybe people perceived who don't work as hard, which often is a stereotype amount for black people, particularly in American culture, then it becomes like if an economic issue becomes racialized, which often happens, then I guess what I find is like we can't really draw this clean line between economics and culture, even though if, there, if the Democrats never said defund the police and always said minimum wage, that would be good. But most issues have an economic and a um, cultural lens at the same time. Wrapping up here, you wrote in your piece that for now, it seems like the woke are winning. Do you think that they're likely to be successful, that this movement on the left is likely to be successful long term? It's hard for me to look at what we're seeing now and how the Democratic Party has changed in terms of being more quality focused and think that um, it's going to go backward because a lot of these things that these activists and so on are saying are 
kind of like if you look at the if you look at the evidence pretty carefully, it's like hard, a it's hard to justify the income inequality between white and black Americans without talking about Jim Crow or slavery or things like that. One and then two. It's even if your actual view is that black people have less money because they're lazy, we're getting into a culture where you probably can't say that out loud in, in a way that you could have like 20 years ago or imply that. And therefore, it's hard to win an argument when you're sort of saying people shouldn't be too woke as opposed to what your actual position is. Like, So I think these ideas are going to get more popular in liberal circles. And I think you're going to see more and more kind of cities. They're not going to defund the police, but they're going to, but I think when an argument becomes, should we have more police funding or more funding for mental health? I think mental health is going to win 10 out of 10 times unless there's some kind of huge crime wave. So I think these ideas are going to win on the left. I think they're so unpopular on the right that I don't know what happens there. Like if you live in a Georgia, I don't know what happens in a swing state like that. So these ideas are going to become more popular in cities run by Democrats. They'll be done by the Biden administration. I think that they won't get more popular on the right and they may be sort of overturned by President Tom Cotton, in fact. So if you think about if we live in two Americas, which I think is increasingly the case, then I think in sort of blue America, these ideas are going to move. And in red America, they will not move at all. And therefore, in America, America, it depends on who's in charge. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Thanks a lot, Perry. Thanks, Galen. And you can check out both of Perry's pieces describing the ascendance of these ideas on the left and some of the backlash on the right on 538.com. They're great reads, so I suggest that everyone go do that. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidigary Curtis is on audio editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.